Sorry, I love Oros. I'm still trying to master drinking water without Oros. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so much to learn. <laughs> so little time. <laughs> anyway, um, it really, really, oh, really is her. such a privilege to be here today. I, I, I cannot tell you how excited I am. And thank you, Sue. Thank you, Justine. Thank you, everyone. Just really grateful. Okay, today I'm speaking on living in limbo. So I just want to start by giving you a mental picture. <clears throat> Number of years ago, my dad and I went to Mauritius, never been snorkeling before. We we're out on a boat. I'm already climbing down the ladder, like the rungs of the ladder. Next minute, I see all these dudes backflip off the side of the boat, and I'm like, eesh, that looks awesome. Look the other way, and there's my dad backflipping off the boat. And I'm thinking, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So with all my might, backflip backwards, but needless to say, my fin had got caught in the rung of the ladder. So it was stuck in the ladder. I hit the side of the boat, and I was dangling there between heaven and hell in my mind, screaming blue murder, but to no avail because everybody was snorkeling. So everybody's heads are down in the water. I look over. I'm trying to get my dad's attention, and he's busy. And the next minute, he does look up, and I can see he's thinking, I wonder where she is. He looks up, even though I was upside down, he makes eye contact with me and literally puts his head down and continues. I was like, you're kidding me, just owned by my own dad. But this actually set the tone for the rest of the holiday because I am a bit of like a craziness magnet. So most of the time my dad is just, oh, I don't know her. So that followed me. But the picture I want you to have in your mind is me dangling from the side of the boat. I wasn't in the water and I wasn't in the boat. I was somewhere in between. And that's really what limbo is. It's between stages. It's where you're not in, you're not out, you're not up, you're not down. You're in between, a place of uncertainty where you're not sure what the outcome will be. And examples of limbo are often between a death and a funeral, between a separation and a divorce, maybe on a positive side between a a pregnancy and a birth, or receiving God's promise and seeing his fulfillment. And for me, it actually all started last year in May. My dad is like my superhero. He's just like a machine. My whole life, he never complained of like any pain. Last year, May, he was just, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. So he was in and out of hospital, and they were poking and prodding and tests and scans and biopsies and everything, and they couldn't find anything. And three months later, they determined it was cancer. But they couldn't identify the primary source. So no chemo, no radiation, no nothing. They couldn't do anything. It took another two and a half months to determine that it was pancreatic cancer. By the time they discovered this, it was stage four, it was terminal, it had spread everywhere, and he had a few weeks to months to live. And during this time, I really started seeking God, and I said, how do I live well in this limbo? How do I rejoice always during this time when inside I can feel the anxiety and I can't breathe and it's like the life is being squeezed out of me? How do I glorify you, God, in this? So we all go through periods of limbo, whether we like it or not. And sometimes they last long and sometimes they're short. We think long, we think of David, we think of Joseph in the Bible. The challenge is to prepare for these and not to fear them. You know, fear causes paralysis, which can cause us to get stuck in limbo. Okay, I'd like to look at Philippians 4, uh, verse 10 to 13. So we know here that Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He was in prison at the time, thought to be in Rome around AD 61. So he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So they'd actually sent him a financial gift, so it was really a thank you letter. I'm not saying this to you, bec this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every, any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I love this with Paul. Firstly, he says he learned the secret. So it's not like receive the gift of contentment. He had to learn it. And how did he learn it? 
by being in situations of plenty and need. And he says to be content, no gray area, in any and every situation. I don't know how many of us can say that. So with Paul, we see the standout feature of this book is his response to his limbo. He doesn't allow his circumstances to dictate his sense of well-being. His well-being is derived from his sense of destiny, knowing what God has gripped his heart for. He doesn't rely on circumstances, as we know they can't produce contentment. And we actually see this Jesus model this when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. So we don't seek those things, knowing that in them we can't be content anyway. We seek him, and he adds them to our lives. So what is contentment? The dictionary defines it as the state of being mentally or emotionally satisfied with things as they are. I don't know how many of us can say that we are satisfied with what we have, who we are, and where we are going right now. Contentment seems to be that rare and elusive thing. There's a story of a pilot that's flying over a lake, and he looks down and says to the co-pilot, you know, when I was a little boy, I would be on a rowboat fishing, and I would watch all the planes overhead, and I'd think, one day, I wish I could be flying that plane. He says, now I'm the pilot flying over this lake, and all I want is to be the guy in the rowboat fishing. So the weird thing is those things that we strive for, that we think will bring us contentment, when we get there, it's like they don't satisfy, and we need more and more and more. We're always living for it, like in the future, like when I'm meeting when I get married, or when I have a baby, when I get a new job, or when I move homes, when I immigrate. In my case, it's always when I get through financial year end, when I finish my audit, God willing. But we're always living in the future. Um, and those things, the things we desire, are not necessarily bad. The problem is when they become the end goals, when they become the focus of our lives. We need to get out of the land of er, I call it, where we want bigger and better, we want to be prettier and thinner and smarter and richer, and we want whatever's newer, because all those things, the possessions or the money or the, or the activities, they actually can't fill the void that's inside of us. They leave us actually wanting more. It's like drinking seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you become. And I think of Jesus when he says to the Samaritan woman at the well, the water that I give you, that eternal, life-giving water, you'll never thirst again. Anything else, we will thirst again. We will want more. So true content contentment. It's a skill. It's a discipline. It's an attitude of the heart. Every time we're faced with two choices in every circumstance, we can either get stuck there, it can be through moaning, groaning, fear, whatever it is, or we can choose to purposefully and deliberately lean into the possibilities that God has for us in that situation. And um, it's already a choice. Recently, I just heard of the doldrums. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. I didn't know about that <laughs> until a few days ago. But um, it's actually five degrees north and south of the equator um, is the doldrums, where there is no wind. So sailing ships that get caught in that can get stuck there because there's actually no wind to propel them through. So what a lot of the sail ships in time gone by did is they had lots of little rowboats on the ship. They would then put these down, they would hook them to the main boat, and they would actually get the sailors to try and throw, try and row them through the doldrums. So even in those situations in life where you feel you're not moving and you're drifting and you're stuck, like I said, we've got those two options. The key is even in that to keep rowing. And that rowing is to deliberately and purposefully choose to see God's possibilities in the situation, even when you're stuck in that limbo. Okay, I'm all over. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Doing well. Moving on. So the one beautiful thing that Paul could see is he could see his life from God's point of view. It's that inner sense and rest and peace, knowing that I am his, knowing that my life is right with him, and that God is control in control of everything that happens in our lives. And you know, we say this, that he's in control, but do we really believe it? 
you know, often we look at our prayer lives and the things that are the focus for us, and we think, are we seeking after are those things, or are we truly seeking after the Lord? So true contentment is that soul satisfaction in God's wisdom, that he does know what's best for us. Okay, most important, how do we acquire everything in lives? Thank you. <laughs> okay, how do we con- acquire contentment? Jesus has to be the focus. So we know this, that Jesus truly has to be the focus. The secret to contentment is trusting in the person of Jesus himself. I just want to read something that author Rob Kubin talks about contentment based on conviction. And I think this really summarizes it. The Bible calls us to allow our convictions, not our circumstances, to govern our sense of contentment. True biblical contentment is a conviction that Christ's power, purpose, and provision is sufficient for every circumstance. We are to learn how to walk through all kinds of adversity, believing in and experiencing Christ's sufficiency. We have to choose to rest on God's good promises despite what we may be going on in our lives. True contentment comes from trusting Christ and having faith that in Him you will have everything you need. He's sufficient, and his promises are enough. Full stop. (laughs) Okay, a second thing that helped me last year is being present, living in the now. I think we're always living in the future. Even when we're with people, how often are we really focused in the now? Are we already ahead, a week ahead, a month ahead? And um, your presence is a gift from God. But in that presence, the Lord actually gives you the seeds which you plant to give you the future that he purposes for you. And you have to plant those seeds in the now. So I'm actually going to show you two photos. One is my garden. Beautiful. (laughs) That's currently where I live in my pet paradise. It is the Garden of Eden. God does live there. It's it's a fact. (laughs) Now I want to show you, Greg and I bought a new house, which we're going to move into when we get married. That is the garden (laughs) of the new house. So, yes, I'm not too content right now. (laughs) But that is the garden. Um, It's actually beautiful in that it's a 1,000 square meters of nothing. It was like an old tennis court that we had to break up. But I know that now, even in this presence, I have the seeds to plant for the future that I purpose or the future that I see. And hopefully that starts next weekend. (laughs) But anyway. But, you know, life is... Life is like a long-distance race. And don't we wish, I always wish, like a long-distance race, there was someone on the side going, four laps left, three laps left. And you can know, like, I can pace myself. I know where I'm at on my race. Um, And wouldn't it be for all of us when they jumped out and they said, one lap, you're on your last lap. How many of us would run different? It wouldn't matter how exhausted we are. It wouldn't matter what our circumstances were in life we would run with all our might. So my encouragement is don't waste your life. Don't wish it away that you're always living in the future and you're not appreciating the present that you have right now in your life. Living in the present is only possible when we appreciate and steward the time that God has given us. So how do we appreciate the value of time? We see it as a never again to be experienced commodity never again to be experienced. So this moment with you right now is never to be experienced again. So I'm really grateful I am here with you today. (laughs) Um, And you know, even these moments, sometimes they are punctuated by pain and by joy, but we have to live in them. You know, towards the end with my dad and for many of you who've maybe lost a loved one to a terminal disease, it's it's terrible at the end, and um, my dad was like in and out of consciousness, and then he was with us, and then he wasn't, and towards the end, the one day he took my hand, and he just said to me, you know, my girl, I'm not dead, but I'm not alive either. I don't know where I am, and I just thought he's living in the ultimate limbo of his life hanging between life and death, and I thought, Lord, how, how, do, I, how do I live well in this? And it was truly that appreciation for this moment. I had this time with him, whether punctuated by joy or whether punctuated by pain, that I had to appreciate the moment that I had with him. The next thing I'd like to look at is our thought life. 
the secret place where nobody but God sees. Our thought life affects our attitude, our heart, like a body, whatever you put in, whether it's food or exercise, determines whether you have your lean, mean machine or not. <laughs> Call it not, I'm not. Um, we choose what we think. We choose what we think. And recently, I don't know if it's because I was coming here, the last four weeks have been like a minefield, battlefield of the mind. I feel like I am not only just back in limbo land, I feel like I'm the mayor of limbo land at this moment. But my thoughts, it's been the thoughts, the voices of people in my head. It's been the enemy's thoughts. It's been my own fears and insecurities and somewhere in between the Lord too. And what I started doing is I started engaging with these thoughts started thinking about them. Well, where does that come from? Why do I feel that? Why do I feel good? good, good. <laughs> Having a whole debate. And the longer I engaged with these thoughts, the more they became my reality. And it was really a tough thing. And that's why we see Paul in Corinthians encouraging us to take every thought captive, to be in surprise. You can't engage with these things because eventually they affect our thinking. Paul tells us to think on those things which are good and pure and holy and of good report. I made a decision recently, too, is refusing to worry. You know, we say, I don't worry or whatever, but if we really believe that God is in control of every part of your life, then there really is no need to worry, that he has you. He has you in the palm of his hands. And then thankfulness, rejoicing always. Thank him for what you have. I think half the time we look at our lives and see we see what we don't have, and we see this in our prayer requests. It's always what we don't have. Let's see what we do have. And remember his faithfulness throughout your life. Just being faithful, faithful, faithful. And let that promise give you the faith to believe him to be faithful in the future. Not only does he give us joy and peace, he is our joy and peace. And then my last point is to keep your heart pure. And this, I think, is one of the hardest things. When you're going through these periods of limbo and People have all their heads in the sand or heads in the water. In my case, your own father's like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know who she came with. And there's no one, and you're feeling alone. And like in the doldrums, you are just drifting somewhere on sea. Can you allow, can you protect your heart from allowing resentment or offense or bitterness to creep in? When life doesn't go according to plan, can you still remain joyful? Solomon in Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And I love it. The wisest dude ever. And he's saying, basically, if you remember nothing else I said, above all else, guard your heart. And once again, no gray area. For everything, everything you do flows from it. And sometimes when we pick up those offenses that can cause us, like a terminal disease, to get sick inside, and you don't know it's there until it's too late and you've actually you've, you've like destroyed the plan of God in your life. So as much as we fight today, every day, for contentment, we need to fight against discontentment. So I just want to end with four easy to recognize strategies that the enemy constantly uses with us. That's guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Guilt. Guilt says, I owe you. I took something from you. It leads to walls of authenticity, walls of secrecy, and those secret secrets eventually suck the life out of us. So how do we deal with guilt? We confess. We confess to God. We confess to the person. And if necessary, we confess to a friend. And sometimes when you confess, it results in damage to the relationship. But there can't be healing until there's that confession to bring reconciliation and to set you free. The next one is anger. Anger says, you owe me. You've done something to me. You have taken something from me. Either you pay me back, or I pay you back, or I'll hold it over your head forever, and I'll pay anybody back that even, or anything back that even reminds me of you and this situation. And that is the problem with anger. Anger is not isolated to the incident. Anger, Anger is not stationary, it's mobile, it seeps, it creeps into every part of our lives. I remember I worked with a girl at Nedbank and her first husband cheated on her horrifically. Her second husband was like amazing. 
But he always said, if I can get my hands on that first husband, because she was reaping the reward of what that guy had sown in her life. But that anger didn't stay there. It ended up seeping into every area of her life. So anger, what do we do with anger? We forgive. We identify what was taken from us. We cancel the debt and we say, you don't owe me anymore. Greed. Greed says, I owe me. It's the assumption that everything is for my consumption. My heart goes out, but my money and my time and my energy usually don't follow. And with this one, people often feel that they're competing with the stuff in your life. So the greatest skill in life is not accumulation. It's contentment. How do we deal with greed? We give. You give. And give something that's big to you, whether it's money or whether it's that possession. Sell it, give it away. And be able to say, I will not be controlled by possessions or emotions or the flesh. And the last one is jealousy or envy or covetousness. This one says, life owes me. Somebody got what I deserve. And the the problem with this one is we get that thing that secretly in our hearts we enjoy when that person possibly fails or when they lose. So this one is a tough one. And I think this one is a lot deeper. This one is not only does life owe me, but God owes me. So how do we deal with jealousy and envy and covetousness? We celebrate. We celebrate what God has given them. We celebrate what God has given us. And we celebrate out loud. So next time you run into Tom at the office who got the promotion that you and everybody know you deserve, can you go, congrats, Tom, I am... (laughs) so happy for you. (laughs) I wish you all the best. And sometimes we have to behave our way past these things that end up or have the potential to pollute or contaminate our hearts. And for me personally, I just wanted to end with try not to compare yourself. I think comparison is the big thing that causes jealousy and envy and covetousness to rise up in our hearts. Don't compare. We've heard it said, run your race. You know, stay in your lane. And I know it's hard. Sometimes you you not only feel that people have overlooked you or your boss or the church or God, you're like serving him faithfully. 30 years, new little believer, three months in the lane next to you. And he's like 100 Ks an hour. And next month he's leading leading worship. And you're still trying to get to leading a home cell. And you're like, really, Lord? But the thing is, ultimately, we stand before God for what he has called us to. And in my own experience now with getting involved with Greg and the church, there's a temptation to want to meet everybody's expectations and do what everybody requires or expects me to do. But I have one responsibility, and you have one responsibility, to do what God has called you to do, to run your race, yours alone, and finish the course. Sometimes in life, you know, you, it's like a card game. You dealt your hand of cards, and uh, you have like a three, and a nine, and you look at your neighbor, and it's like a king, and an ace, and you're like, what? But play the hand that you've been dealt. And I can honestly, from the last year, tell you, God loves surprises, and you don't know what that next card is that you can pick up. It can change your whole life, and next minute you've got a full house. I don't know what that is, but apparently it's cool. (laughs) So in conclusion, um, I know John Piper always says this, but I think it summarizes the whole desire for to live in contentment, to be able to usher in the wind of God's next season for our lives, is that God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Amen.